Hi, Miss Nikki here. Welcome to Chapter 3. This chapter, I hope, is going to kind of bring together all these ideas that we've been talking about from Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. So it's kind of putting together the chemistry and how it's used inside the body. So we're going to talk about energy, and we're going to talk about reactions, and we're going to talk about cellular respiration. Cellular respiration, how do I turn that glucose into ATP? Or how do I take the energy out of glucose and store it in ATP? All living organisms require energy. And the energy that we're going to keep talking about is stored in the bonds of ATP. So we need energy to power muscles, to have muscle contraction. And most of us think of skeletal muscles when we think of muscle contraction. But in order to pump blood through a tube, through our vessels, we also have to have muscle, but that type of muscle is called smooth muscle. To absorb nutrients, to exchange respiratory gases. Remember, we take in oxygen and we exhale CO2. To create new molecules, sometimes you need ATP as a helper for an energy source. And then to establish cellular ion concentrations. I know this doesn't make a lot of sense right now, but I kept saying how important sodium and potassium were and that these ions, remember, char, positively charged here means it lost an electron. And then here's my phospholipid bilayer. So this is my plasma membrane or cell membrane. Having these ions on a specific side of the plasma membrane, either outside or inside, it's set up or established by something called an ATP pump. So some of this might seem over your head right now, but I swear as we finish uh, muscles, a lot of this chemistry is going to make sense. You're going to see why we had to understand the chemistry in order to understand muscle contraction. Glucose broken down through metabolic pathways, cellular respiration is the process, forms ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. So basically you're breaking the bonds of glucose. Remember, glucose has six carbons and then a bunch of hydrogens and oxygens hanging off, right? So every time you break one of these bonds, you're basically taking the energy out and you're storing that energy in the bonds of ATP, the phosphate bonds specifically. Let's talk about energy just a little bit here. Energy's basic definition is the capacity to do work. And we have different classifications of energy. Are we talking about stored energy, so potential energy? Or are we talking about the energy of motion? So actually in motion, that's kinetic energy. You can convert from potential to kinetic. So what they're saying is, can we take stored, let's say food, right? Can we take stored food energy and can we turn that energy into motion? Can we use the food that we eat to help our muscles contract so that we can move? Most of us would say yes, right? Did we talk about glucose being stored as glycogen? Yeah, we did. Okay. Here we have an example of potential energy turning into kinetic energy. So we have stored, and on this side of the plasma membrane, this is a phospholipid bilayer, right? Here are my two layers of phospholipids. That's my cell membrane or my plasma membrane. On this side, I have stored a high number of sodium ions. On this side, I have a low number of sodium ions. So usually on the inside, I have low sodium ions, and on the outside of a cell, I have high. And we're setting up this potential. Uh, we sometimes call it a resting membrane potential. And we'll see this again when we talk about muscles. So if we open this channel, now the sodium ions are going to move from high concentration to low concentration. So a book gives a great example about water um, and a dam. So if you build up water on one side because you built a dam, 
that's potential energy. And then if the water starts flowing over the top of the dam, that is movement, right? That's kinetic energy. And when you're moving from potential to kinetic, you can harness that energy and you can use that energy to do work, which is basically what we're doing when we do cellular respiration. We take the potential energy that's stored in glucose, we break the bonds, we pull the energy out, we store that energy as ATP, and then we can break the phosphate bonds to get energy out. And what are we going to do with the energy from ATP? We're going to do work. So I keep talking about potential energy, and I keep saying glucose. Well, sometimes we just want to be a little bit more specific, and we'll say that this is chemical energy. It is a type of potential energy. So you have potential, and you have kinetic. Under potential energy, you have this category called chemical energy. So it's the energy stored in chemical bonds. And this is probably important to know as we move through that the molecules that function in chemical energy storage, the molecules that we can readily break down to release energy are going to be triglycerides, we should be thinking fats, right, glucose, and ATP. So we're going to take glucose energy and we're going to store it in ATP, but then remember we have the adenosine with those three phosphates. We can also break this bond and release energy to do work. So ATP in itself is also a form of chemical energy storage. So a list here of lots of different forms of kinetic energy. These two are probably the most important for right now. The rest of these are going to come up when we talk about special senses, when we talk about the ear, or we talk about the eye. So electrical energy is the movement of charged particles. We just saw an example where we moved sodium ions from one side of the plasma membrane to another. So the movement of a charged particle is electrical energy. Uh, mechanical energy is exhibited by objects in motion due to applied force. Um, probably the heart's the best example of this. Your heart muscle is contracting, your cardiac muscle contracts, and that pumps blood through your cardiovascular system. So we're putting the blood in motion due to the force of the muscle contraction of the heart. Laws of thermodynamics. First law. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. So can I take potential energy and can I turn it into movement kinetic? Can I take stored ATP energy and can I turn it into body movement? Yes. Second law of thermodynamics. When we do this, when we change the form of energy, you're going to have some of it lost as heat. What they're saying is it's not 100%. You cannot take 100% of the potential and turn it into 100% movement. You're always going to lose some as heat. So you can think of this um, kind of like a car if you want to. So um, when the car is taking the gas right, the potential energy that's in gas and breaking down those molecules and moving the axle of the vehicle, the car gets hot. You cannot have 100% conversion, therefore some of it is going to be lost as heat when you change from one energy form to another. Metabolism is a combination of all the reactions in a living organism. So if I'm putting things together or breaking things apart, right, anabolism and catabolism, I am doing biochemical reactions, we call that metabolism. Chemical reactions, we just want to make sure that you know what a chemical equation looks like and what are the reactants and what's the product. So the reactant is anything you put in and a product is anything you get out. If I have this equation A plus B yields AB. These are the reactants. This is the product. This should look familiar to you. Hydrolysis reaction. So
So here's a disaccharide sucrose, and sucrose is made up of one glucose and one fructose. So this was our polymer, right? And I break our polymer down into monomer 1 plus monomer 2. We can also have a synthesis reaction. An example would be dehydration synthesis. I have two amino acids and I want to form a dipeptide. What do I do? If I remove water, I can form this peptide bond between the two amino acids. ATP is constantly being cycled. So you can start with ATP. You can break the bond here between the phosphates and what's going to come out good, you're going to have energy released. This phosphate, if you broke the bond, the phosphate's free. So you're going to have this free phosphate, you're going to have energy released, and what's left over? The ribose is still there, the adenine is still there, and these two phosphates. So now we have adenosine diphosphate. Here's our two phosphates that we had left over. We only broke one bond. Can I add anything to ADP to make it ATP again? Yes. If I add phosphate and I add energy, I can cycle back to ATP. So ATP molecules can be used again and again. We can add energy to them, then that ATP molecule can go somewhere in the body. It can do work by breaking the phosphate bond and turning into ADP. So sometimes you'll see it written without the images. So we say ATP releases energy plus a phosphate and it forms ADP. Then if I put in energy plus a phosphate, I can turn ADP into ATP again. Just some wording here. Um, and for you to recognize if you see this double arrow going the opposite way, it means that it's a reversible reaction. So depending on what the body needs, you can take the reactants, A and B, and you can turn them into AB. If you have too much AB, you can break it down into the individual components. So some reactions are reversible. Reaction rate is a measure of how quickly a chemical reaction takes place. So if I have AB polymer and I want to break it down into the individual monomers, how quickly that reaction takes place is called a reaction rate. The energy required to break that bond, so there's a bond between the A and B, okay, I can write it as two carbons if you want, right? So that bond right there What's the energy required to break that bond and split that polymer into individual monomers? Overcoming that activation energy. So proteins act as catalysts to lower the activation energy. Activation energy. I think this figure does a really good job of explaining how important these enzymes are. So remember, enzymes are proteins. They're proteins with a specific job. So here is sucrose. This will be our polymer. And we keep saying, oh, we want to break our polymer into separate monomers, A and B, right? So we want to take sucrose and break it up into glucose and fructose. So here's the activation energy without an enzyme. So they're saying it's uncatalyzed. So if we had no enzyme present, we would need this much energy in order to break apart the sucrose. If we have an enzyme present, if an enzyme is present, so we call that a catalyzed reaction, we only have to put in this much energy. So enzymes are helpers. They lower the activation energy necessary to pull this molecule apart. 
So how exactly does an enzyme lower the activation energy necessary for the molecule to be pulled apart? So here is the activation site or active site of the enzyme. You can see that the molecule is moving into the active site. These are very specific. So the substrate is the term that they use if we're talking about enzyme action. Substrate is also the same thing as reactant, right? It's the thing that you're putting in, right? And what comes out? Products. Okay, so this substrate is going to move into the active site and it gets a hug. It changes the shape of the enzyme we call it a conformational change. The substrate actually binds with the enzyme. This puts stress on the bonds that are inside the substrate and it allows the substrate to be acted on or pulled apart with lower energy than if the substrate was just off by itself. So active site is very specific to substrate. I just want you to look at these endings. This is what I meant by very specific. So lactase is the enzyme. And what does lactase do? It breaks down lactose. Um, DNA polymerase, poly, many, ACE, it's an enzyme. So this is some sort of enzyme that's going to do something to DNA and probably adding things together. So DNA polymerase is the enzyme that allows us to make new DNA. RNA polymerase allows us to, to copy RNA into DNA. Uh, sucrase is the enzyme that breaks apart sucrose, the sugar. So enzymes are always named, or most of the time, 99% of the time, they're named after the substrate. And they end in ACE. If you like words better, you can run through this PowerPoint or you can read in the textbook. It's breaking down exactly what's happening. So the substrate binds the active site and forms the enzyme substrate complex. The enzyme changes shape, results in a closer fit. The stress on the chemical bonds permits new bonds to be formed. Products are released. The enzyme can complete the process over and over again. It's repeatable. So enzymes are not used just once. They can be used many, many times. Here's an example of a decomposition reaction using an enzyme. So here is lactose. Lactose is going to bind the active site of the enzyme lactase, forming the enzyme substrate complex. Then we're going to have this induced fit or this hug of the enzyme that puts stress on the bonds. The bond is then broken between glucose and galactose, and now we have our products. So hopefully I've made this clear. A substrate is a reactant. It's just if you hear the term substrate, you know there's an enzyme involved. Here's the opposite. Here's the synthesis reaction. We have two monomers of glucose and we want to join them together. Here's the enzyme. And can you see that the active site looks very different from the last one we saw, right? So this glycogen synthetase ASE has to be an enzyme. It synthesizes what? Glycogen. So this is a very different active site. That's why it's a lock and key. It's very specific for the substrate. So the two glucose monomers are going to bind the enzyme. They're going to form that enzyme substrate complex. You're going to have an induced fit. It's going to allow a bond to form between the glucose molecules. And now you have the product, which is glycogen. On this slide, we need to talk about concentration. How do concentrations of substrates and enzymes affect reaction rates? 
what happens if I increase the enzyme concentration? I have 100 substrates, and I put that into a container with 100 enzymes. That reaction will probably happen pretty quickly. What happens if I have 100 substrates and I put one enzyme into the container? It's going to take a lot longer for those 100 to break down into the products if I only have one enzyme doing the job, right? What about substrate concentration? They want you to realize that at some point you can have saturation. What they're saying is if I take 100 substrates and I put that in with 100 enzymes, if I added more substrate, if I did 500 substrate with 100 enzymes, this reaction might not happen any faster. This is the workhorse, right? The enzyme is doing all the work. If I only have 100 spaces, it doesn't matter how much substrate I put in. It doesn't mean the reaction is going to happen any faster. So now we have to look at temperature effect on enzymes. So this is kind of environmental factors. This chart is done in Celsius. 40 is about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So here's our normal body temperature back here, 98.6. A little bit of a fever is okay. A little bit of fever um, increases your enzyme activity. If you're trying to fight off an infection or you need to make more white blood cells to fight off the infection, a little bit of fever is good. Usually once you get over that 104, 105 range, you're going to start breaking down your own enzymes. So the enzymes that are in your body that are doing good work like creating ATP, those enzymes will start breaking apart and they won't be able to do their job. Remember that term denature, denaturation? So if the temperature gets too hot for a particular enzyme, it will cause that enzyme to break apart. pH does the same thing to enzyme activity. You have an optimal pH for enzymes. Usually for most human enzymes, it's between pH 6 and 8. If it's too cold, they break apart. If it's too hot, they break apart. But I do want to stress that protein or enzymes, which are proteins, are specific for their pH environment. So I think I mentioned the stomach has a pH of about 2. So any enzymes in the stomach, this is going to be their optimal. This is going to be their normal. I'm going to warn you up front, cellular respiration is one of my favorite topics, so I'll try not to go too crazy. So this is a multi-step metabolic pathway. You're going to take organic, so that's carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen containing molecules. You're going to oxidize them and you're going to disassemble by a series of enzymes. So you have enzymes that are doing work to break apart organic molecules. The potential energy that's stored in the chemical bonds of glucose is going to be released and that energy is going to be used or contained inside ATP. And oxygen is required if you're going to do aerobic cellular respiration. If you do anaerobic, that is without oxygen. But oxygen, you can take one glucose molecule and you can make about 36 to 38 ATP energy molecules. What we're doing is called glucose oxidation. I'm not sure if you've heard uh, Leo the lion says GER. Um, if you have a loss of electrons, that's called oxidation. If you have a gain of electrons, that's called a reduction. I know, I wish they had named these differently, but that's just the way it goes. But maybe you can remember Leo the lion. So what are we doing to glucose? If we're doing the oxidation of glucose, we're losing electrons. We're stripping electrons off of glucose 
and we're taking the energy that we get from these electrons and we're storing that energy in the bonds of ATP, specifically those phosphate bonds, right? This is the part that I want you guys to look at. So this is a balanced equation because I've put these, or the textbook has put these numbers in front of it. You'll often see me write the equation and I won't necessarily put these in front. I want you to know what are the reactants and what are the products of cellular respiration. And I'm going to add something over here. So if I was going to put this into words, this is glucose, oxygen, yields, carbon dioxide, water, and ATP energy. Here are the four uh, phases or steps. The first one is glycolysis. Then you have something called the preparatory reaction, that's phase two. Then you have the citric acid cycle, which is phase three. And then you have electron transport chain, which is stage four. So aerobic, that means with oxygen. You can make about 36. Eh, sometimes you'll see the textbook go up to 38 ATP molecules. It depends on how efficient this process is or the enzymes in this process. And this happens in both plant cells and animal cells. They want you to see that animals and plants both generate energy using this system. Anaerobic, this is without oxygen. And the anaerobic pathway, you can see you generate much less ATP. So this is not really efficient. I kind of think of anaerobic as just keep the party going, right? Um, sometimes I like to think of this as if you're running. Um, if you're running and you're breathing normally and everything's fine, you're in aerobic respiration. And then when you get to that part where you're kind of sucking wind, right, you're doing the, <gasps> you might be in anaerobic. You're not getting enough oxygen to run all four steps. You're kind of stuck in this step. You have a little bit of energy being produced. It's kind of just to keep you going until you can kick back into aerobic respiration. So athletes, especially endurance athletes, they want to stay in aerobic respiration. This is kind of you're generating the most energy so you can have the most muscle contraction. So what do I want you to get from this whole crazy picture? Can you tell me that cellular respiration happens in both plants and animals? Can you tell me the difference between aerobic and anaerobic respiration? Aerobic is with oxygen, generates 36, 38 ATPs. Anaerobic, just two without oxygen. There's a four-step process for all of this is cellular respiration. Um, I sh you should also recognize the mitochondria. So mitochondrion is one, mitochondria is plural, but we usually have more than just one. So part of the reaction has to happen inside of the mitochondria. So that's why sometimes you'll see people say mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. What are they doing? They're helping facilitate the generation of ATP molecules. This image is from your textbook. The last image was from my Biology 103. If you're really interested in this topic and you want to know more, you can go to my Biology 103 playlist on YouTube and you can watch the cellular respiration video. It goes into a lot more detail about exactly what's happening. But here we have the blood vessel. We have to take the glucose. This is from the food that we eat and the oxygen from the air that we breathe, and we have to transport it across the plasma membrane, right? These are phospholipid, phospholipid bilayer plasma membrane. So we have to take the glucose and the oxygen from outside, and we have to move it inside. Then you're going to take the glucose, and you're going to break it down, go through each one of these phases, and every time you're stripping electrons off. Remember we kept saying the oxidation of glucose, right? So losing electrons. All of those electrons are funneled into this electron transport chain. And we take those electrons and we use them 
to create energy to store in the bonds of ATP. And you can see here this last step is where we generate the most ATP. So go back and look at the learning objectives, kind of stick to whatever information I'm asking you for in the learning objectives, and you'll be okay for cellular respiration. But this is going to come up again and again. I'm probably going to mention it every chapter from now until the end of the semester. So um, I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.